Hello and good morning if you're listening to this webinar uh, from the Americas. Good evening if you do that from Asia or good afternoon as you do that from somewhere in Europe just like I where I'm standing here in a studio close to Amsterdam. My name is Willem Bermagne. I am the Director of Communications at Flooring Systems and I will be hosting the webinar today which is on neuroscience and the effects it has on people in indoor spaces. I will be joined for this webinar by Kay Sargent, who is Global Director of the HOK's Workplace Team and sits on the HOK Board of Directors. I will also be joined by Colin Ellert, who is Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at the University of Waterloo in Canada. So we have one of the guests coming to us from Washington and the other from Waterloo in Canada. But first, let me explain why a company like Forbo manufacturing floor covering should be interested in neuroscience and how it affects people in indoor spaces. Neuroscience is a topic that, um, that links to floor covering, if only because floor covering is the largest of the interior finishes that you can, that you can imagine if you look at a building. Flooring, floor covering is omnipresent. In the studio where I stand today, in my bedroom as I got up this morning, in the office where I was this morning, in the evening when I go to the cinema, everywhere, in transport vehicles, my car, floor covering is omnipresent. We design our floor coverings with our team of designers and product, product directors. And we do that with a design philosophy in mind. A design philosophy which we call dynamics of a building. The way we look at our floor coverings is that they are part of a built environment. And the built environment of large buildings like hospitals, schools, public buildings, offices, look alike more than you might think. They all have entrance areas, they all have reception areas, they all have hallways, they all have rooms for concentration, for relaxation, for operation, all kinds of activities that are, that are taking place. Now if you realize how the environment influences people or how people are using the environment, you can design your collections for the various spaces that you are working on. Let me get a little bit more precise. If I look at designing for dementia, which is another area in which we are working together with the University of Stirling in Glasgow, you will see that with floor covering, you can develop floors that have the right light reflection val values, that have the right contrast, that have the right visuals for people in a dementia environment. If you look on our website, uh, of our UK uh, uh, website, you can actually see a white paper which we've written on designing for the mind. It's not that we declare ourselves experts on neuroscience, but we would like to talk to people who are experts. And that's why in the next hour, I will be talking to Kay and Colin on their background and what they have to say on neuroscience and how it positively affects people in indoor spaces. Let's join Colin, out of Waterloo, and Waterloo is this time not in Belgium, which is also, if you look at Napoleon, a nice neuroscience experiment, but uh, Colin is coming to us from Canada. Uh, actually, I looked it up, it's right in between the Great Lakes and the divide between the US and the Canadian border, and there Colin, like I said, is Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at the University of Waterloo. Colin also sits on various boards, he is a member of the Advisory Committee of the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture. He is an Urban Design and Mental Health Fellow, a Salzburg Global Fellow, and participant in the European, uh, in the European uh, Initiative Promoting Baukultur, beginning with the Davos Declaration of 2018. He also published a book recently, which is called Places of the Heart. Maybe we come to talk to that as well. Colin, would you please be so kind to share your presentation with us, and then we will start the question session uh, after that, and we will introduce Kay, okay? Uh, thanks, Willem, for that uh, uh, very nice introduction, and thank you so much for inviting me to talk to this wonderful audience about uh, the neuroscience of interior design. Um, I have a lot to say and not very much time to say it, so I'm just gonna get right to it without messing around. I'll begin with uh, something that I think is fairly obvious, and that is that we spend most of our time in interior settings. Um, about 89% of our time, as it, as it turns out, is spent inside some kind of built structure. 
Um, what's maybe slightly less obvious is how important that is to our well-being. So one estimate from the CDC is that about 30% of the determinants of well-being are related to the built environment. And when you consider that the estimate of the contribution from genetics is only about five to 10%, then it becomes clear that how we design our interiors um, must be really important to well-being. Here's a really simple example uh, from a study conducted in the UK comparing what they call lean and green office spaces. And you can see an example of each kind of office space on the slide. So the only real difference between lean and green spaces in this study was that the green spaces had some, some plants in the office, that was it. And yet the findings from the study suggested that people reported about 15% higher feelings of well-being, but also on objective measures of productivity and creativity, there were benefits of just having office plants. So that's a really simple thing. Imagine if we added more than potted plants to an office, what are the possibilities for being able to enhance well-being in these kinds of interior environments? So um, what I've been asked to do is to, is to inform the discussion of well-being in interiors with some content uh, related to neuroscience. So here's a, here's a very quick crash course in neuroscience with I what I think are some of the key facts to understand. Um, we often think of brains as being isolated organs among a large number of organs in our body and forget the fact that those brains belong to bodies. And so the way to think of a brain is more like this. I think of it as more something like wearable technology. The brain moves around uh, through space with your body, obviously, and takes in a kind of dynamically unfolding experience of your environment. And that's really important. We're not just static observers from one position, we're constantly moving. And our eyes are moving as well. Um, I want to spend a bit of time talking about the organization of the human visual system and why it's important to the design of interiors. This kind of wacky looking illustration that I'm showing actually gives you a way of understanding what comes to the front end of the visual system, the eye, the retina. So if you look at this, this, um, this depiction, what it shows is of course an inverted human figure, but there are other interesting features as well. One of them being that the only part of the, the, the image where there's true crisp detail is in the center and the rest of the image as it falls away from the center becomes increasingly blurry. Um, also notice that most of the color is confined to the central part of the image and not to uh, the surrounds. So it certainly doesn't feel like this is the way that vision works through, through our introspections. It feels as though we have this kind of full color, crisply detailed panorama of the world all the time. But we're actually reconstructing that with our brains. And here's a little bit of the hardware. This is a wiring diagram for uh, a just visual cortex in the human brain. And believe it or not, it's, it's a bit simplified but it's giving you an idea of all of the underlying circuitry that's involved in making for us that seamless understanding of the visual world. To simplify things a bit, you can take this, this elaborate wiring diagram and kind of divide it into two halves, where the left half, all of those areas that are shown there are involved in spatial processing and the right half is involved in object recognition. Um, here's another way of, of seeing exactly the same kind of breakdown we talk about streams in visual cortex. We talk about a parietal stream that's involved in spatial processing. And we talk about a temporal stream that's involved in object recognition. Now, if you think back to that, that graphic that I showed you illustrating what the front end of vision is like and overlay it on this idea of these two separate uh, processing streams, one for spatial processing and one for objects, you end up getting something like this. This is obviously an incredibly complicated diagram. I don't expect you to take in everything that you see here, um, but I put a red box around what I think are, are a couple of the most important things to recognize. So to break things down, first of all, the top half of this diagram is showing you things that happen in the peripheral visual field. So that's outside of that colored, crisply detailed center. And the bottom half is showing you what happens inside the central visual field in the fovea. And the red box surrounds the words pre-consciousness and primary emotions of atmosphere. And what's meant to be conveyed by that is that we think that the 
peripheral visual field is preferentially involved in promoting what we call architectural atmosphere. So here's kind of an everyday example. Imagine that you're in a, in a cafe. For, for many of us, this is still something of a memory rather than an everyday experience, uh, but soon one hopes. Um, you're in a cafe. Um, the cafe, the reason that you go there in part is for the ambience. There are nice textures. There are plays of light and shadow. There are sounds. There are furnishings, all of which contribute to the atmosphere of the cafe, the reason why you're there. So if you look at this illustration, it's showing that ambience, but missing some critical features in the central visual field. Now, if we do the opposite, if we block out the periphery and just so show the central visual field, then you can manage the mechanics of drinking a cup of coffee, but you're kind of missing a lot of the point of the environment. So uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about some, some of the kinds of experiments that we do to explore the contribution of the peripheral visual field to uh, emotional, uh, to architectural atmosphere and emotion. So this is a, a kind of a, it's called a psychophysical experiment that involves very briefly pre presented displays. And the, the, the three rectangles that you see represent a time sequence. The top one is what the participant sees first just a black screen. And then there's a very briefly flashed stimulus, which you see in the center. And notice the times. Those are the times for which that stimulus is displayed. And we go as short as 50 milliseconds. So that's an incredibly short period of time. That's a 20th of a second. You could fit three of these images into one eye blink. That's how short 50 milliseconds is. And we've done some work with chimeric images, uh, which just means that we have displays where the center and the periphery of the visual field show different things, as you can see in these, these grayscale images. And for us, the key question, or one of the key questions has been, if you present something to somebody for that short a period of time, 50 milliseconds, what do they actually see? What gets represented? And this is a busy slide, but basically what it shows is that if you ask people to give you the gist of a scene, they are much more likely to identify the gist of the periphery of a chimeric scene rather than the center. So it's the periphery that, that gets to you. The periphery wins with these very brief exposures. So why do we care about these uh, arcane sounding laboratory experiments? Well, again, it has to do with architectural atmosphere. Architectural atmosphere enters the mind via the peripheral visual field. Why do we care about architectural atmosphere? Because it has implications for behavior. Here's a, a really simple example from another experiment that we did with a, a virtual reality rendering of a, a house. This was a Frank Lloyd Wright house. So at the bottom of the slide, you see a plan view of the house. The colors just represent the amount of visible space that a participant could see from any particular location. So in other words, just how much floor space was visible. And what we measured was the arousal levels of people as they walked into this home and into that large um, open living space, which is represented by the yellows in that bottom image. And the arousal curve at the top of the screen shows that as people walked into this space, their levels of arousal rose. Things happen as a consequence of architectural atmosphere, all kinds of interesting and important things. So given all of that, what should we be doing with, uh, with the peripheral visual field? What kinds of positive things can be done to, uh, to promote uh, good behavior in built settings? Well, there's a long, rich tradition of research in my field that suggests that images of nature invoke positive emotion and restore our ability to focus. So, and, and one of the, the ideas about why that might happen it might lie in a mathematical property of images of nature called self-similarity or fractality. And the classic example is the fern. If you look at this fern, you can see the same shape repeated at a number of different scales. And what we think is going on is that there is actually a brain area shown on the left side of this slide, the area that's highlighted in those kind of gold and orange tones. There's a brain area called the parahippocampal place area that responds positively to those kinds of scenes of nature. So it's as if we're hardwired to respond to and be attracted by those kinds of scenes that have those kinds of elements of fractality. 
And the right part of the slide shows that this is an area that not coincidentally, I don't think, is also rich in, in opiate receptors. So it suggests there might be a natural reward pathway for nature images, um, very much akin to other kinds of reward pathways that we know that we have in our brains for things like food and sex. And what's interesting about that from the design standpoint is that it's not just potted plants that can drive these kinds of brain areas. Any kind of display that has these kinds of fractal uh, elements in design is likely to promote the same kinds of, of positive feelings. Now, just to finish off, I wanna to turn to a different kind of, of image that elicits responses. Um, fractals aren't the only things that are important. Um, you may be laughing as you look at this slide, as you recognize the drunken octopus in this uh, simple coat hook of a kind that probably many of you have seen. Um, this is an example of something called pareidolia. Um, here's another example. You know that it, this kind of thing happens all the time. You've experienced it, I'm sure. We see faces where there are no faces. And we think one of the reasons for that, not all that different to the example from nature, is that we have a brain area called the fusiform face area, very important for us as, as, uh, as humans that we understand, recognize, and understand the emotional valence of, of faces. So we have dedicated hardware for doing this, but that area we think works over time. So even in images that aren't explicitly faces, where we see faces, those pareidolic images, so-called, there is some suggestion that, uh, that what's happening is that that fusiform face area is being invoked. And so that might also have implications for interior design. When we think about things like our preference for uh, quantities like symmetry in environments, uh, we're also attracted to symmetry in faces. So there might be certain resonances there as well. Um, so that's, uh, I won't uh, belabor all of the conclusions ex except for the last one in red, which I think is perhaps the most important thing for, uh, for today. Um, we know a lot about, at this point, about how the design of our brains affects what works in design and what doesn't. But almost all of the neuroscience in this area so far has focused on just one kind of brain. And we know that there isn't just one kind of brain. And I think that's what most of the rest of today is devoted to exploring. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Very interesting. Um, that's a remark I should never make when the presentation is done, that it's an interesting presentation. I was a little bit baffled by some of the things that you were saying. Um, one is, you said, when it comes to the architectural atmosphere, that it is the periphery that wins. Should I imagine that when my sight of field is like that, this, and on the periphery is the ceiling, the wall, the floors, and all the interior finishes, is that then which is dominating my experience? Is that how you mean to say that? Yes, it's certainly, I'm not, I'm not sure that I would say it exactly that way as dominating the experience, but it's certainly dominating your emotional experience of, mm -hmm. a, of a setting. Um, so we clearly need the central visual field for uh, instrumental things like being able to interact with the world, grasping, uh, reaching and so on and so forth. But when it comes to the ambience of a setting and its emotional effects, uh, which I think are incredibly important in, in uh, discussions of things like well-being, I think that it is the periphery. Um, mm -hmm. Our responses to things that happen in the periphery are immediate and, as I showed, really, really fast. It only takes a few milliseconds for us to generate those feelings that come from the peripheral visual field. So yes, the yep. floor, the ceiling, mm -hmm. um, the outer walls are all really, really important to uh, a well-designed built environment. And another thing you were saying that uh, caught my mind was, if you look at early floor coverings, well, it was uh, clay, it was stone, it was wood, then textiles came, then by the way, linoleum came as the first resilient floor covering, offering a smooth floor covering. But what we see today is that when we, we, we look at our designs and we see nature, natural designs being very popular, the oak floor, the wooden floor, whether it's in vinyl, whether it's in linoleum, whether it's in parquetry, whether it's in real wood, it seems to be everyone's dream to have that type of a floor. Is that what you mean by bringing nature or natural elements into the house, the popularity yeah. of wood? Yeah, it is. I, 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 think, I think you're right, Willem, that we do have this, this innate, I think it is, attraction to natural materials of various kinds. But even, as I mentioned, when we're not explicitly using a natural material, if mm -hmm. we are simulating some of the important aspects of nature 
in our design. So for example, you mentioned linoleum. There are some wonderful examples in tiling patterns of the use of, of fractals. Um, okay, uh, yeah. And uh, then, yeah, um, that, those are important aspects. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for now. Let's move to uh, Washington. Let's um, introduce Kay Sargent. Like I said, Kay is Global Director of HOK Workplace and is part of the HOK's Board of Directors. HOK is a global design company for architecture, engineering and planning. Um, and you might say it's much more than that, Kay, but uh, I also want to mention that in 2020 you were named ASID's Designer of Distinction. Uh, you've got quite a track record. People have been reading your bio up on the uh, website. Um, and you are going to talk about uh, neurodiversity of the workplace. Absolutely. And this, this, this is a topic that is near and dear to our hearts. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have spent the better part of four years doing a tremendous amount of research on this topic because it really all started with a very simple question from a client about four years ago when they asked, how do you design a space? to be more welcoming for people that have ADHD. Okay. And having design spaces for ed the educational system, we had an answer to that, but when it really came to workplace, we didn't have the full-fledged answer that we wanted, so we started to do a deep dive into that. And I'm gonna share with you uh, some of the research that we're finding and just kind of start with a little bit of a primer about what it is that we really see when we're talking about neurodiversity. So and we're living in a time where there's an increased awareness about neurodiversity, which really includes um, people that are on the autistic spectrum disorder, uh, Tourette's, ADHD, dyslexia, and Parkinson's. And Parkinson's often is not included in that bucket because in most conversations, it's geared towards younger children because that's primarily where a lot of the research has been done and where the focus has been. But as we are getting older and older and more, we are working longer and longer, uh, you know, Parkinson's, which really typically starts to show signs in your 50s and 60s, becomes more of a reality in the workplace that we need to deal with. And it is the fastest growing sector of neurodiversity. And we like to say, you know, there can be a very complicated, Colin, I'm going to take the opposite approach, right? So I'm a designer, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to dive way down into the science well, and I'm going to try to just kind of uh, keep it really simple and, and apply a lot of the things that you said. Uh, for us, we really kind of look at people that are neurodiverse are just wired differently. And you could actually argue at the end of the day that we are all wired a little bit differently. And so they just tend to process information and their environments and their surroundings differently. And I think the interesting thing is that one in seven people today are considered neurodiverse, but fewer than 50% of the people that are even know it. That's primarily because in past generations, it wasn't something that was diagnosed, but yet we have a younger generation today that has been, that is acutely aware of their uh, conditions and what they need to be doing to retrofit, whether it's the environment or themselves or the behaviors that will help them be more successful going forward. And so there are a lot of challenges that people that are neurodiverse really face. You know, 85 to 90 percent of adults with ADHD don't know it again because we had a generation that really wasn't diagnosed. Uh, when it goes untreated, on average, they can lose 22 days of pro productivity a year. They can be 18 times more likely to be considered discipline problems or 60% more likely to lose their jobs. And before COVID, uh, depression was affecting 14.8 million Americans. And the people that are neurodiverse tend to even um, constitute a higher percentage of that because as they age, kind of those comorbidities start to take effect and so they tend to have more challenges and therefore tend to suffer more from depression. Um, but in a post-COVID era or a post-pandemic era, which hopefully we are getting to sooner than later, I mean this is it has really taken a toll on everyone and the CDC has noted that you know there are four times higher rates of depression and anxiety in 2020 one, then we really suffered in 2018. And so this is an issue that is impacting a lot of individuals. And people that are on the autistic spectrum uh, tend to be underemployed. 
but they tend to be very, very brilliant. I mean, 65% have above average intelligence, yet 85% remain under or unemployed. And as we go into a war for talent, being able to tap into every possible um, group that we can really will, will be able to aid us because people that are neurodiverse also have a tremendous amount of advantages that they bring. They tend to have extreme brilliance. They tend to have super hyper focus. They tend to be able to see the bigger picture, stretch the boundaries, think outside the box and have this amazing capacity for innovation, which is why a lot of entrepreneurs, Richard Branson, Elon Musk, have publicly come out and noted that they actually believe that their neurodiversity is actually a superpower, that it, it prohibits them from being held back, right? They think bigger and they aren't held back by those typical things. And companies that have set up programs where they are targeting, whether it's bringing autistic individuals in that have that hyper-focus and it might help with coding, have found that they can be 92 times or 92% more productive than their counterparts when put in the right environment. And that's an astonishing result, but it's one of the things we think that is really important today. And so we really look at people that uh, are neurodiverse really as having a superpower. And I love this quote from a, a student with autism who said, we are freshwater fish in salt water. If you put us in fresh water, we will function just fine, but in salt water, we will struggle to survive. Meaning the onus is really on us to create environments where everyone can thrive. So if we look at the way that we all as people respond to the built environment, respond to all the information that is coming at us, there's kind of this range and there's what we would call neurotypical or that typical range that most people tend to fall into. But on either ends of that spectrum, you have people that are hyper sensitive, that can't take too much stimulation, they get overwhelmed, whether it's touch or smell or lights or visual distractions or acoustic distractions. But on the other end of that spectrum, we have people that are hyposensitive. They actually need more stimulation. And if they don't get that stimulation, then it starts to come out in other ways. Um, and so it's really important that we kind of create both of these scenarios. And it's really across all of these, the sensory perceptors that we're getting today, whether it's sound, visual, tactile, smells, and our proximity to each other. And you could actually argue that now, in the pandemic era, everybody has a heightened sensitivity. You know, So people before that might have fallen into that neurotypical range right now might be having a heightened sensitivity to proximity to each other or what they're touching. And so a lot of the research that we have been doing over the years about neurodiversity actually is probably applicable to a much larger percentage of the population that we know, because again, we all process that sensory stimulation differently. And so if you've got people that are hypo sensitive or leaning that way, and people that are hyper sensitive or leaning that way, and you've got this whole spectrum of things that are coming at us, the only way that we can really create environments where they can all be successful is to give people options and choice, to give people an ecosystem across the portfolio that enables them to find the right setting at the right time. And think about this, it applies to introverts and extroverts. It applies to days when you're in a good mood, feeling very social versus days when you're, you're not and you are feeling like you need to have some distance and some boundaries. And so we really identify the six modalities of work, the things that are happening in workplaces, and then looked at how do we create a hyper and a hype o version of both. So for instance, I think in most spaces today, there are phone booths or phone rooms, but if you take someone that is hype o sensitive and you put them in that environment, they literally will be bouncing off the walls, right? And so what's actually better for them is something that might have fidget furniture, they can get up and they can write on the boards or mark on something, they can interact with something, and they have a little bit of shielding, but they're not totally boxed in. And it's not just about providing the space, it's about the design attributes. So, you know, I can't even look at a design magazine anymore, anymore because there's always that picture of that phone booth that somebody wanted to make exciting and fun, so they put bright colors and crazy patterns in the phone booths, right? But 
the whole purpose is to eliminate those overwhelming distractions that people can't process easily. But now you literally lock them in a confined space with those things, right? And so we as designers really need to not only dig deeper into the science of design, but understand the elements and the principles and how they apply. And we really need to think about how can we seamlessly interweave all these solutions? And I will say a very common um, experience and expression when we share our research is when we show images, people are like, well, oh, that, that looks normal. I would expect it to look really different. Well, that's the intent, right? We don't want to create spaces that make people feel like they're being called out or that they're different or unique. We want to really make sure that they can seamlessly blend in into spaces. And so when we start breaking away from the norms of having repetitive rows and rows of work points that are exactly the same because everybody has to be assigned to desk and we can free ourselves up to unassigned or free choice seating, then we can really start to address not only those six modalities of work and ensure that we have the right blend of spaces, but we can create hype O and hype er versions of those spaces. Even in a small neighborhood like this, you can achieve all of those different options and varieties without being too overwhelming for the individuals. And one of the things I think we also know is that some people really like routine and they are creatures of habit. Sitting in the same place and having that predictable control is also a choice when we create these types of environments that can be important. So our research really dives into not only um, you know, what are the key attributes from a hypo and a hypersensitive, but what are the things that we know that really help people, people do analytical work? So whether that's uh, cooler colors or regular patterns or being able to control the amount of stimulation versus people that might be hypersensitive and might need some of those same attributes, but maybe a little bit more freedom. They may not want to be boxed in. Um, they may want to be able to stand and interact with their space versus being, you know, sitting, et cetera. So we really kind of have gone through those six modalities and identified the key elements that we believe will help people be successful in creating environments that are really more welcoming and suited for all. Because we believe there is a compelling human in a business case really to be made for how we approach design and that we need to be able to think about mindfulness, health, safety, well-being, and inclusivity. So as I said before, some of those spaces, if you look at this on the surface, this might look like a, a typical lobby that you would walk into, but there's a lot of very intentional things that are done here. So on the left, it is, you know, um, no, no obstacles on the floor, clear lines of sight, straight lines, very linear, high ceilings, you arrive, you want to power in, you can just go right for it, no obstacles. But if you're an individual that just needs to take a moment and get grounded and just take a breath and get resituated to your environment, you can step off over to the side where we have the drop ceiling and we have the wood elements that bring in elements of biophilia and fractals in the ceiling. We have a different lighting uh, scheme that's happening there. We have access to water or a places where you can sit and a little punch of color that makes it inviting, but not overwhelming. And so that's the type of balance that we really start to look for. Or in reception areas where we want them to be very natural, very intuitive, very welcoming to individuals without, you know, the very first thing you see is a security guard that is staring with you or all this equipment or, you know, screens and scanning, et cetera. And in gathering spaces, you know, in this case, we just took the walls off this end so it's more open and free so you don't feel confined, but we've dropped the ceiling so that you feel like your, your position in place is secure. And we've made it so that it's more of a canopy-like ceiling, which is more in line with natural daylighting. And then we've given opportunities for a variety of settings where somebody who is hype O sensitive might get up and be working at the, the board where somebody else might choose to sit on the back bench and have a little bit more control or a little bit more buffer uh, between themselves and their colleagues. Or spaces like this, where we really look at 
Um, how do we create areas that don't need signage? And as designers, we really believe that if we design space well, we don't need a bunch of, sign, of signs everywhere telling you what it is. I don't need a sign telling you that this niche or alcove we've created is an opportunity to refresh the change in flooring, the elements of hospitality, the plants, the change in ceiling and the change in lighting, the coloration, all of those things are suggesting that this is an opportunity or an area where I can go and just take a moment and take a breath, right? So good design is often intuitive and very simple, but it also needs to be balanced for those people that are hypo sensitive, right? And have all that excess energy and they wanna get it out. So game rooms aren't just about this funky thing that we're throwing out there to try to attract. It can be a saving grace for people that have that energy and they need to get it out in a socially acceptable way. And it can also help people interact with each other, but we need to have kind of options and choices. So there's single settings, there are group settings, and then there's that you know kind of group dynamics because some people wanna, be part of the action, but maybe not thrown right into the middle of it. And then when we can use elements like color and materiality to create memory or mindful moments or wayfinding. So you know, that staircase is identified by that big, huge, bold, bold splash of color that is giving us a a reprieve during the day that's giving us that jolt. But if you, had, you, you don't necessarily want to stare at that wall all day long because it could get overwhelming. And so the strategic use of color can help with refreshing, can help change the mood, can help with wayfinding, all of those things that I think are really important. And then of course, also the concept of prospect and refuge, right? So as Colin was talking about bringing in those natural elements, you know, we believe that not only um, is it important for our health, but as we go high tech, we have a desire as organic creatures to connect in an organic way. And the more high tech we go, we really see the more authentic or real or transparent we want our environments. We want to be reminded of those things, but it's also important in this day and age that we remember that a lot of people are feeling anxious and they're not feeling safe. And so creating environments where there are clear lines of sights, you can clearly survey your surroundings, you know, like going back to that concept of uh, prospect and refuge. I wanna be able to see everything. I wanna know I'm safe because if you don't feel safe, you can achieve nothing else in the space. You're feeling anxious and to be able to perform at a high level is almost impossible if your basic needs aren't met. But you also want areas that you can tuck into where you have refuge that you can retreat into so that you have some control about what's coming or what you're going to encounter. Because we believe we are really no longer just designing environments, we're designing the experience. And we believe it's really important today that we design those experiences to make everyone successful and make everyone feel welcome. So, Willem, I'm gonna throw it back over to you. When do you come in into a project? Is that right at the beginning together with the architect and the designers or are you called in when buildings do not work, when they do not function, when it's just not a pretty place to be in? Um, well, being a design firm, we get we get brought in right off the bat, right? And I think what we really think about is how do we start to design spaces and continue to design mm -hmm. spaces really from a human-centric standpoint, right? Yeah. How do we take the user's consideration first? In the last 10 years, really specifically the last four, we have just unlocked a treasure trove of information about the science of design. So our industry has always done a great job of creating beautiful spaces, right? But there is absolutely a science to what we do. There is a science to how people perceive color and this and scale and mass and forms and shapes and what makes people feel more comfortable and what makes them feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so understanding that and applying those principles early on really help us create these spaces that can be more holistic and more inclusive for everyone. Is there a chance that the images that you showed us, that they are the places that are going to win, that our environment is really going to look like that? I'm asking this because if I look at the typical US office environment with all the little cu cubicles and all the little desks and 
walls like yeah. this, which is typical U.S. style for us, um, that doesn't reflect the images that you were that you were showing. Is that going to disappear? Well, here, yeah, here's the good news. All of those images are from projects that were done in the last few years. So they, yeah. those are all active projects. And I think that is the direction that we are going to. And I think, you know, I think you're right that we have been a little bit behind. But we look at COVID as a wake up call, maybe a slap mm -hmm. across the face to the entire industry. And we're telling our clients that now is the chance to go bold. Okay. Now is the chance to have courage and to design spaces that are enticing because we forever design spaces that people had to go to. They no longer have to go there. They are untethered from uh, their space from a technological standpoint. And now they've crossed the last barrier, which is social acceptance. And so now it, there is a, a level of social acceptance for people to work remotely, which is still working itself out, mm -hmm. right? M yep. Mixed bag there. But we now have to create environments that are enticing enough and welcoming enough and feel right that people want to be there. Yep. If I look at our work environment, then people think floor covering, there's a building being erected, it needs to have a floor, we come in and deliver the floor. As a matter of fact, 70% of the work that we do is in refurbishment. So the building is already there, there already was a floor. The new owner wants to have a different image, wants to have a different environment and chooses a new type of floor. And also can imagine that for you refurbishment is a big part of your day-to-day -day work. Am I correct in that? Redap uh, re um, adaptive reuse, adaptive reuse, and okay. regenerative yep. design, mm -hmm. and circularity are three massive concepts in the architectural world right yep. now, which basically all yep. say: use mm -hmm. what you have, extend its life, yep. and uh, you know create energy from within, and um, reuse existing things. So how, how can we take something that we've used before and repurpose it? So I'll give you an example of that Dairy Farmers of America, you know, all the wood in that project is from repurposed barns throughout the Midwest that were brought in as elements. So we're recycling, we're reusing, mm -hmm. we're reducing the waste, but we're also tying people back to yeah. their core brand and mission. Okay, good. Maybe it's um, good to call uh, Colin in and uh, start a little bit of a discussion. There's, uh, there's some questions from the audience. Um, there's one uh, question that I have for Colin first, and you can answer as well, Kay. Um, I give a personal example. I have an office which, when I first joined Forbo some 20 years ago, I did not particularly like. It wasn't fancy, it wasn't high-end, it was so-so. And I'm still in that office building, I'm still in that office, and I kind of like it. So are there surroundings, however badly designed, however neurodiverse they might act on my temper or whatever, that I really come to like? Is that possible, Colin, that you just like your environment? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that one of the, the, uh, the determinants of uh, well-being in a space I mean, there, there, there's something that we sometimes call hominess. Mm -hmm. And hominess has been uh, demonstrated to be um, a, a, a dimension of the built environment that actually attracts us and, and makes us feel comfortable, just as the word might suggest. And I think that one aspect of hominess is familiarity. So, so yeah, I think I think that there's uh, th there is a sense. I. I uh, Willem, I, I share that with you. I have a, a terrible office space that I've inhabited for 30 years. And I keep thinking, you know, I could do so much with this space, and yet I don't, because it, for one thing, every particle of that room is invested with memories of different mm -hmm. things that have taken place, people that have visited, where they've sat, and all of that goes away if I do a redesign. So, so yeah, yeah, I think there is, there is a role for familiarity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I want to I want to tag in on that mm -hmm. one and just say that you know one of the things we are finding right now is actually it's not right now it's, it's an age old problem you know people resist change because mm -hmm. they like predictability and the more unpredictable the world becomes the more they seek some kind of control or predictability and mm -hmm. so everything is very unsettled right now and a lot of companies are starting to adopt new ways of work and they're getting a little bit of pushback. 
um, and because we are asking people to go into uncharted territory. And I think what we need to do is to educate people about the, the pros and the cons and the positive benefits. And, you know, quite frankly, we are pretty adaptable. We don't like it and we fight it, but we actually are really very adaptable as humans. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, once we put people in, in some of these new environments, you know, they might have fought us for, you know, a month or months. And then they get in there like, wow, this is great. I love it, you know. So I think um, we are asking people to go into uncharted territory, and that can be uncomfortable for a lot of people. Yeah. What about cultural influence or what about segments where you can work in? Let's talk about culture first. Um, if I travel to Japan, United States, or even within Europe, if I go to Italy or Belgium, which is just 100 miles away from where I live, I come in a different world. There's a different sense of what is cozy. There's a different color scheme. The furniture is different. The people are different. How much influence is there from, let's say, the culture in which you live? And how can you design for that, Kay? So we design spaces uh, for companies that have a, port a global portfolio. Uh -huh. And I could talk for hours and hours and hours about the differences and the regional nuances. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are societal. You know, so some, some countries have a, a caste system. Uh, and, you know, trying to break that down in the office becomes very difficult. Some countries, it's, uh, you know, the use of technology and surveillance is accepted on a much greater uh, level than it is in others. In some places, like, like in North America, a lot of people have single family homes, whereas in Asia, you might have smaller family units, multiple generations. Mm -hmm. And so they're more eager to, you know, to go back to that shared space. They actually have you know, that that's really important to them. Where in the US, it's a little bit different. We build things differently. Um, so, you know, there's there's a variety of things. Our infrastructures are different, our codes are different, our regulations are different, and our, gener our, our um, communal responses to each other tend to be a little bit different as well. And so all of those things come into play. And when companies are rolling out these global standards, it's really, really important Mm -hmm. that there's some consistency, but that you also realize that regional nuances are going to play a role and you accept that and you determine to what level and you're ensuring that you're creating something that will be accepted in that local area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Colin, uh, Kay also mentioned that one in seven people have some kind of neuro disorder. She didn't call it disorder. It was, it, it was more diversity. Um, and then um, she talked about the, um, the sensory perceptors, so sound, light, smell. Um, which of those are most annoying? And maybe let's, let's, let's take a case for an office. Um, if there's one thing I would get away with, it is sound or it is smell. Or if there's one thing you should work on is the climate, uh, the temperature or... How does it work? Is there one that is that is more dominant and more prominent than others? Uh, in terms of uh, it, its effect, I'm I'm not exactly sure how I would answer that. I mean, the the, the first obvious thing to think of is that is that uh, unlike basically all of the other senses, um, mm -hmm. vision is the easiest one to shut yeah. off. We close our eyes, so. Um, I know certainly in studies of, of things like uh, open office environments, the predominant sentiment um, in those studies has, has been that um, people's negative responses to those environments often come from sound. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's very difficult yeah. to close your ears. I suppose you could wear headphones. Mm -hmm. um, so some of those senses are, are more pervasive in, in the sense that, is the, that if, if something unpleasant is going on, then there's, there's no escaping it. Um, I think in in the science there has been for um, a, a weird bunch of reasons really, and some not so weird I suppose. There's been a predominance of interest in the visual system. Mm -hmm. Many would argue an an, an over predominance of of studies of vision, in part because it's easy to study compared to other senses, and in part because we know that so much of our brains are devoted to uh, visual processing compared to uh, to the other senses. Mm -hmm. But I think until the other senses catch up, and, and we're on the way, certainly with, with sound, um, we, we 
can't have a full answer to that question. Maybe to yeah, turn so the question. I'm going to tag in on that one. Yes, that's fine. Go ahead. Because if, if you were sitting in a space and there was a dead fish next to you that smelled horrible, mm -hmm. you would not be able to stay in that space. Okay. <laughs> Right. And I, you know, so, so smell is a very, very powerful mm -hmm. sense. Uh, if somebody were jumping repeatedly in front of you, that might be really annoying, but you might be able to block that out to some degree, right? Like there's a whole lot of people that are, that are on Zoom calls where their family is going nuts in the background and they, they still tend to function. Um, and or for other, you know, some people it's sound. We all react to the, to the different simulation that is coming at us in different ways. I could spike really, really high on sound, but be really, really tolerant of visual. Mm -hmm. Every person is a little bit different. And that's why some people can find one environment perfectly suitable while somebody else is really bothered by it. And so it is a it, it varies from person to person, but there are certain things that just kind of cross the line that nobody mm -hmm. can tell. But if you would turn the question a little bit around and just ask what would be the main type of individual human needs that you could identify? So, okay, as you work, what do you look for for people to experience? Because that's, that's their inner need. Well, my, my answer is going to be an odd one, but it's choice and control. Uh -huh. okay. okay. If I could just do one thing to help everybody it's give them options and choices mm -hmm. because I might love sitting in an open environment because, you know, I might be an extrovert and I need that extra stimulation and I love it and I like the sound and it gives me that energy and it gets me going. Colin might hate it. And if we're both assigned to sit next to each other, I could be thriving and he could be dying, right? Like he could be totally suffering. But if he had the choice to get up and to move to a quiet space, or an area, some people temperature really bothers them. So if I could move to a, a cooler area of the floor, or sometimes women don't feel as comfortable being you know, on display or exposed, they can move to a space where they have more control. The ability to control your surroundings mm -hmm. is really the only way that we have figured out can really make everything equal because I can't design a space that's the perfect temperature for everybody. We all react to it differently. I can't design a space that is the perfect sound for everybody. But I can give you choices and options of different zones, and you can choose the one that is most fitting and right for you, where you feel comfortable, but your colleague might choose something very different. So options and choices mm -hmm. that give people some control, I think, is really essential. You might want to say that, uh, or you could say that, the digital age in which we are living today, it actually enables this choice. So with my iPhone or smartphone, I can control temperature, I can control light, I can control sound. But at the same time, this digital age, maybe Colin, you can say something about that, is, is less um, practical for people who are neurodiverse. If you have children or people with ADHD, ADHD uh, people who have autism, dyslexia, they cannot really cope with this modern age. Are those two conflicting signs? Yeah, I think I think that, you know, it, it, uh, on the one hand, you're right, that there are these tremendous advantages to being able to do things a lot more, a lot easier than we used to because of uh, the digital world. But um, I think... What you have to balance against that is is the fact that we know that there are people who are tremendously invested in leveraging uh, that those digital tools to capture our attention. So you know, people talk about the attention economy, which is all about you know, grabbing usually eyeballs, um, but grabbing people's attention in order to uh, to extract resources from them, information. Uh, m money, uh, whatever. And so I think that that kind of framing of, of uh, the digital world does really work against uh, certain sectors of, of humanity. Um, uh, so, you know, if we think about things like, like problems with, with teenagers that we're seeing with overuse of, of cell phones, and in some cases gaming, I think par part of that comes from our uh, now incredible um, ability to 
command people's attention using these kinds of tools. So as with, you know, essentially any kind of technology that you can think of, um, it's a it's a double edged sword. There there is the potential for tremendous good, but at the same time, there's a there's a dark side. So it's so let me give you the uh, tremendous good side of that because you're, you're right. There is a tremendous downside to this, but there also can be a good side to this. And you know, if I have the ability to record a meeting so that I can go back yeah. and listen to it at my leisure later, or if I have sound can canceling headphones that can help me block out some of those distractions or if I can dictate and things are um, you know, brought up and, and I can speak and it's written for me, or I can break task into chunks and help me manage my day. There are a lot of ways that technology can actually really help individuals with, um, you know, that are neurodiverse, but it really has to be balanced. Would you say that design controls neurodiversity or smoothens neurodiversity? What would be the word that you would... It if done well, mm -hmm. it can help make people, uh, make, make the space more approachable and accessible. Okay. If done poorly, it can absolutely sabotage any individual. And I think it's really interesting that this year, the World Health Organization has reframed the definition of physical disability. Mm -hmm. And before it was a person with a physical disability. Okay? Now it's when a person with a disability encounters a space that is not supportive of them. That's a very different thing because what it's saying is it's not the person that is the challenge. It's the environment that isn't supporting the person with the challenge, right? And so the onus now has been flipped onto the environment. And we have the ability to create spaces that can aid individuals and make them be much more successful or absolutely sabotage them from day one. Mm -hmm. If we look at our design philosophy that we have at, at, at Forbo Flooring Systems, where we talk about the dynamics of a building, what we're also saying is, no matter whether you're entering a hospital or an office or um, uh, an education uh, facility, nowadays they all have some kind of a shop, they all have an entrance area, they all have corridors, they all have rooms for concentrating, relaxation, stuff like that. Um, yet, is your design and is your thinking when it comes to neurodiversity different when it comes to a hospital or different when it comes to a school? or different when it comes to an office? Yes, okay. I mean, there, a, lot of the simil a lot of the practices are, are the same, but you have different populations and different purposes. So for instance, in public spaces, people may not be as familiar with those spaces. And so wayfinding and navigation and mm -hmm. you know having some control is a lot more important. And in public spaces, I may not be able to set up all of those zones that I might be able to set up in an office. Uh, an office tends to be a place that you go to on a fairly regular basis, right? And so you can yeah. have a little bit of predictability and control. Uh, and, you know, I think we look at flooring as often people, uh, and, and Colin, I'm going to pick up on something that you said, often people that are neurodiverse have a hard time staring other people in the face. Quite frankly, there are a lot of people that are, that are neurotypical that have that same challenge. And so they tend to look down or in other locations and they're perceiving all these things from their peripheral. But people that, that will look down, there's also a high percentage of people that get vertigo when they are neurodiverse. And so they can get very disoriented. But if the flooring is intuitive, if they're natural breaks, if there's a change of materiality from uh, you know one type of space to another, and it's a regular pattern, it can actually help navigate you through the space and help you with that wayfinding versus a pattern that might be totally chaotic, make mm -hmm. absolutely no sense and be totally random, you're, you're totally lost, right? And if you're in a public space that you've never been in before, you can get overwhelmed instantly. I have one last question, which is about the last 18 months, the COVID era. Has that helped you forward in your thinking or in your perception of how things should work? Colin, in your area, did you change anything? Yeah, it's, it, it definitely has. I, I think, you know, what, one of the ways that, that I describe it sometimes is, is that I think that what, what 
the last year and a half has taught us with these lockdowns is uh, that there were a whole lot of problems with the built environment that uh, we were not taking as seriously as we should. Mm -hmm. Having so much of that taken away from us and having certain parts of it become so much more important to us than they ever have been before, like our home spaces and, and our natural environments, that's really sharpened the focus. And, and hopefully it's something that's that's not going to go away as we come back to whatever post-pandemic uh, life we, we have ahead of us. It's, it's revealed, um, it's thrown into relief a lot of stuff that we should have been paying attention to, but weren't doing a very good job of. Okay. Kay, is there something I should have asked, but uh, did not ask you or? Well, I'll, well, I'll just say this and, and, and tag on to what Colin said about the COVID era. For some people, this has been, uh, you know, that, that are overwhelmed in shared spaces and have a hard time being in those spaces. Being able to work at home has been a blessing for many of those individuals mm -hmm. that have struggled for a long time. For others that need the stimulation of being around others and need that guidance and need that energy, it's been, you know, a year in purgatory for them. And yep. it's been very, very difficult for them. And so again, different people respond differently. But I would say that what we are seeing now is again, this heightened sensitivity from everyone and awareness about their surroundings and being much more sensitive to them. And it, it really, um, that research that we've done is really applicable to a much wider group of people. Yeah. And, and that will probably continue for some time, mm -hmm. that this heightened sensitivity. Okay, good. Thank you very much, very much for your time. Um, we're done. It's uh, almost five minutes past five. Uh, for you, it is the start of um, a new Tuesday. For us, uh, it's time to get a beer. And for others in Asia, it's time to go to bed. Thank you very much for your uh, contribution. Thank We've made a recording us. of the um, uh, webinar, which um, you, can, you can find via the link somewhat later in this week. Thanks again very much for uh, your time and thank you all for joining us and um, viewing this webinar together with us. There will be a next webinar somewhere in September. The topic is not yet known, but it sure is going to be interesting. Bye-bye.